Thank you. Well, welcome. We're, we're delighted that you could come to the elevated, life elevated uh, program since you had to come up the stairs. This is the only one that's, uh, that's higher than the others. So, but we're, uh, we're delighted to, uh, to have you here today. I, I hope that you can hear me. Can everyone hear me fine? I feel like I've talked through some, some pillars somewhat, but I'll try to move a little bit so everyone can see me. Can everyone hear fine? If not, well, I'll try to stand behind the microphone, but it's, uh, I'd rather not be pinned down there. What we want to do uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, some things, but first thing we want to talk about is kind of why we're here in terms of what government, what is the purpose of your, your organization's existence? Why do you exist? And, and if we can get to this understanding of why and we can communicate that level of, of understanding of why to everybody in your organization, how can that help them to do better, to function better, to make good decisions, to be better engaged uh, employees? And uh, so I, I just wanted to, to start with this. Uh, everyone has seen the, the kind of the advertising program that the state of Utah had about Life Elevated. And, and I, sure, I don't even need to sign counts. I know everyone's seen this Life Elevated. A lot of beautiful uh, scenes of, uh, of the state of Utah with that logo, Life Elevated. And uh, just for myself, I, uh, I've lived in four countries uh, over an extended period of time, a total of about uh, 11 or 12 years overseas. And I've lived in five states in the United States, uh, having moved to Utah just, uh, just a couple of years ago. And so it's been interesting to compare the quality of service, the quality of life uh, at these different places. You know, I'm just coming from, uh, the, from New York, the state of New York, which uh, I felt not like someone being served, but I felt like the state was almost like leeches just trying to, to suck all of the life out of me. <laughs> it was the opposite of life elevated. Um, as a matter of fact, though, I, I had to, uh, to travel uh, quite a bit through some rural area of, uh, of upstate New York while I was there. And um, I, I went through a small town that was a bit of a speed trap, and I got pulled over. It's like six o'clock in the morning, and I get pulled over. The policeman says, that, "I'm sorry, you're going a little too fast, and I'm, I'm going to have to issue you a ticket." And he said, "He said, well, your options are you can plead guilty, pay the fine, and you get points on your driver's license, or you can contest it. You set a date with the judge. You can go before the judge." and the judge will reduce it to a parking violation. And I'm like, hmm. and this is 6 o'clock in the morning. I, 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 excuse me, did you say you would reduce it to a, a parking violation? He said, yeah, a parking violation. And I was a little dumbfounded. I didn't know what to think of that. And the police officer there in the morning, that morning, he looked at me, he says, well, I don't know, but if it were up to me, I would go challenge it and pay the parking violation. You don't get any points on your driver's license. And so I didn't understand. So I showed up at the, uh, my appointed time, and I was number 100 in line. Number 100. So I go in. You have this process. In the end, I had to pay several hundred dollars for a parking violation, even though I was speeding in this little town. And I asked him, I said, well, why, why change it to a... To a parking violation they said well if it's a speeding violation then the money collected half of it has to go to the state of New York <laughs> so I wasn't feeling life elevated at that time I felt like I was getting scammed <laughs> but there are a lot of places where uh, in government service that there is that feeling that somehow I'm I'm getting abused a little bit and so um, we want to talk about this phrase, life elevated, a little bit. Uh, for us, we think it's important. Uh, Dr. Shingo, um, just for those that don't know, uh, Dr. Shigeo Shingo uh, was one of the guys in Toyota many years ago that helped Toyota to be successful. Um, he was fundamental in creating, really, the Toyota production system that has been the model for many manufacturing operations and now with their kind of lean program as it's developed many other organizations around the world use a lot of those basic principles and he received his honorary doctorate from Utah State University and they established what's what was called the Shingo Prize 27 years ago 
And uh, so we're honored at Utah State to have that connection with Dr. Shingo. His son, Rick Soil Shingo, is a member of our board, and, and I'm with him on a regular basis. And he was also, for 40 years, an executive at Toyota and has a lot of great learning. So Gary Peterson is on our board. It's a great, uh, a great organization there. But um, Dr. Shingo said that know-how isn't enough. And that's what a lot of people, they want to go visit a site, they want to go walk through a Toyota plant, they see charts, they see tape on the floor, whatever it is, and they say, I got to take that. I got to take that chart and I'm going to put it up on the wall in my factory and everybody's going to just go, wow, now we know excellence. And it doesn't work. He says, no, how does it matter? You know, you can walk through the plants, you can pick up all the artifacts, all the stuff you see, but it's what's underneath it that makes a difference. He says, you have to have what he called no why. It's not the know-how, it's the know-why. That's the critical thing. And if you have the know-why, as they talked about this morning, this blue light time, where am I spending my time and how can I use it more effectively? And that's a critical, a critical thing we want to talk about. Now, if we take a look at this phrase, uh, life elevated, which I think is a great phrase, and we want to say to ourselves, well, is that something that we can be motivated by? You know, I, rem I remember my... Um, I have six children. Uh, one of them is an adopted uh, a Chinese orphan. We lived in China. We adopted an abandoned girl, and uh, she's a she's a great young lady. Our youngest was born in Hong Kong, and I remember when she was probably two and a half, three years old. I was reading a book to her. It was one of those books. I think you've seen it, where it, it says, "When I grow up, I'm going to be an astronaut, or I'm going to be a ballerina, or I'm going to be a doctor, etc." And I was reading that book to her. And at the end, it asked the question, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And so I looked to her and I said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she looked at me, and she's three. So I mean, she's just a little kid. She looked at me and, and she gave me this look like, that's kind of a dumb question. <laughs> and she said, I want to be myself. Why would I want to be anyone else? <laughs> what do you mean, what do I want? So it was interesting when she said, I want to be myself. And I realized that she needs to find out who she is going to be. And so last week, she started, she graduated from high school uh, in June, and last week she started at the University of Utah in their nursing program. She's figured out how to be herself, which is to be a nurse. That's what she wants to be. And it's been great to watch that transformation. But it's so much better than just giving her some kind of a written document and say, here's what you have to do. This is your job. Now, instead, she's been focused on being herself. So as we look at organizations, this need to understand why we exist, uh, what is the driving principle that makes us necessary, that gives us meaning? And, and this idea of, of uh, life elevated is something that I think is, is something that is, is critical. I think it can be a very powerful thing. Now, if you, if you look at some organizations that have managed well, especially here in the Valley, um, I think some of you know AutoLeaf, which is uh, a big manufacturer here in the area. Uh, they make airbags. Now, it's automotive parts supplier. They've got people of all different functions. They've got supply, you know, incoming, receiving. They've got manufacturing, machining, quality, and they have all these departments. So it would be easy for them to get bogged down in the details of what. But instead, they focus on the why. And I'm not sure if you know, their motto at AutoLeaf is, we save lives. That's what they live for. That's why they exist. You talk to the person driving the forklift, you talk to the person in the warehouse, you talk to the person in quality, they save lives. And every time they get together and they talk about how they can do things better, they say, how can we change things today to save more lives? It's, it's a vision that helps inform everyone's viewpoint and everyone's decision making. You don't have to look at the procedure to say, what do I have to do? What does the procedure say to do? If you know that ultimately your objective is to save more lives, that informs their decision. And that's the same thing we hope that you can come away with with Life Elevated. And another great company that I think uh, uses this idea of having a clear vision that everyone can, can get behind is Southwest Airlines. 
their motto is, we create freedom. They believe that through the way they operate, they create freedom for far more people than would normally be able to afford freedom. So this idea, of we create freedom, is a very powerful message for them. So what we want to do today, this is going to be a little bit of an interesting thing. We've got 100, 100 people uh, or so. But what we want to do is we want the tables, and for the smaller tables here, just turn and kind of form into two sets of, uh, of tape, two tables for one group. But we want to do a little exercise. I want you to think about this phrase, life elevated. And think about it in terms of quality of life. If, if your department, whether it was park and rec recreation or purchasing or, or pardons and paroles or whatever your organization, if, you're, if your primary reason for existing is to elevate the quality of life of the people that you serve and also the people within that organization, um, that's the, uh, something I want you to start thinking about. Does it really mean something? That's one of the things I, I thought about this when I looked at this logo, because it's got a hot air balloon. So I thought of the phrase, does it really mean something important or is it just hot air? And what we want you to think about as part of this is one of the Shingo principles. There are 10 Shingo principles, and one is called create value for the customer. That's the peak of the what we call the Shingo principle pyramid, is to create value. So when you think about your <coughs> reason to exist and think about this phrase of creating value, how does your group create value? Is this the why that you exist? Is everyone in your organization energized by that? And how can you do it better? So we want you to think about this vision of life elevated, this creation of value point. So we want you to get together. We do have some posted boards. We've got some things that you want to use in terms of markers and, and post-it notes and stuff. 3M's one of our clients, so <laughs> we've got lots of 3M stuff here. Um, but we would like to take a few minutes. We'll see how this is. This will be a great icebreaker for you to meet your neighbor and then talk about creation of value around this idea of life elevated. So just this is the foundation of our discussions this morning. So go ahead, form your groups, and ask, ask yourself some of these questions and kind of see what you come up with. And we'll have a report out on a few of the groups, okay? We'll give you uh, 15 minutes till 11 o'clock. Go. Uh,
We know that some of the tables had people all from the same department or area, and we had some where they were all totally different and unrelated, so um, that's fine. We just want to have a good discussion around this idea of what is life elevated. So, we want to start here. Anyone want to report? Stand up and speak loudly. Okay. So we had members from three different departments. We had from a Department of Heritage and Arts, uh, which is where I'm from. We also had Department of Transportation and Department of Corrections. 
So we talked a lot about uh, value and creating value and what does that mean for our different departments. And we each had different ways that we approached it. Um, in Heritage and Arts, one of the big things that we've been working on is making assets available to the, all the members of the state, whether they are rural or on the Wasatch Front. We want you to be able to have access to the tools and the systems that you need, and that really gives the power back to the citizens to take control of that information and find the things that they need that is going to be of most value to them. Um, in the Department of Transportation, we talked about making systems safer and having the um, ability to always improve your commute times and really placing that value on that time spent doing the things that you want to do and with the people that you want to be with. And how can transportation allow you to reach those goals. And uh, Department of Corrections, we talked about how they create safe communities both within the system and outside of the system. That they're not only trying to make your neighborhood safer, but they're also trying to create an environment for the people that um, are coming into your neighborhood to allow them the opportunities to better themselves and to become um, engaging and uh, better citizens of their community as well. And that's how we've all kind of talked about our creating value in our different ways for the system. Good, thank you. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Great. Do we have another table back here that would like to uh, volunteer to stand up and give their uh, their results? I crashed on a mountain bike this weekend and I'm concussed, so if I don't make sense, that's my mistake. So, um, on, on one particular so item, parks and recreation. Yeah, well, they're right here. So oh, here too. Yeah. I'm blaming them. We have a couple for parks and recreation, three of us are for workforce services. Uh, one thing that stood out that I found that I appreciated was how much what's important to us as individuals drives what we do and the service that we offer. So, for example, parks and recreation. The employees that, that work for Parks and Recreation have a passion for the outdoors. And as a result, that passion is, is emanated in the service that they offer in, in all that they do. And that makes perfect sense. So if you see how that, that's very important. And in uh, Workforce Services, our employees love to serve and help other people. And as a result, they have ample opportunity to do that each and every day. And how that really um, affects the value that we offer each and every day. Absolutely. Very good. Great point. Very good. Thank you. Great. How about in here in this middle zone? Do we have uh, some great volunteers that want to uh, stand up and give some thoughts? How about back here in the second row from the back? We're Workforce Services. Workforce like Services, AI. that's a great group. You guys yeah, but we just about? gave our yeah. <laughs> No, that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. We have to serve people, and that's what we do. We help people find jobs and give them temporary assistance. So, so create value. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said I'm used to have a consistent message. That's right. Consistent yeah. message. We'll talk about constancy of purpose in just a minute. <laughs> because it's important that that message be constant. Good. Well, good workforce services. You're all well represented. So, um, any anyone else in this in this middle area have some thoughts that you have? Yes, sir. So, um, our group. What we noticed is that we are so interlinked. None of us knew each other, but we've got UTA, UDOT, um, Highway Safety, and Health here. We're all interconnected. Um, I'm with with UTA and, and shared a little bit of experience. Uh, plug for Shingo, they're not paying me, but we've tried a lot of things at UTA to become more lean and efficient. Uh, different ISO certifications and things like that. Shingo, is, we're just in the beginning stages, but it's the best we found. So um, what we found is in the past, we would have these KPIs that were kind of the leading, most important key performance indicators and then we drill those down to try to get them to the employees so they know how they contributed to that. That was great, but it's not very motivating. And so after hearing auto leave here a couple of years ago of their saving lives, we switched to think, well, what's a more motivating purpose? What it's not just about key performance indicators. And we switched to improving lives, improving the lives of our customers, our employees and the taxpayers. And then we have measures and projects this year that are focused on really doing it that way and that's much more motivating so 
So that gets to the why rather than just the metric, which is the why. Let me tell you, I'm a, I'm a daily tracks driver. It's a one, I mean, not a driver. It'll be a driver. <laughs> but I ride it, and I think it's a wonderful product. So, well said. All right, well, great. Thank you very much. Okay, and let's come over here to this zone. This is the side here. How about this front table? I saw they were quite active uh, on their board. We were active. <laughs> we were Parks and Rec, Forestry and Fire, and Public Safety. Oh, and DQ. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway, we all save lives. Just like other things all should do. So, Parks and Rec, we create memories, change or improve lives, public safety, all of, these, all of them. And we help people efficiently. So, that's, that's more memories. I, I can't remember what that was. More memories. <laughs> that was the Alzheimer's. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot. I hope that this. Well, I hope that this exercise has gotten you to think a little bit about the why your department exists, because that's going to be very helpful for you as we go through the rest of this. I'm going to pass the time over now to Gary, and he'll talk about the next principle. We're covering four of the ten shingle principles today. Just try to touch on them to help you see some of the things that we think you can do in your organization to really help bring your people in. Thank you, Mark. So, so once you have a clear vision of what it is, what is the value that you provide, and what is it that your people can do to provide value, then the next important things you have to do, whoops, wrong way. Yeah, you got to push this table on the right. Don't push that button. Got it. All right, uh, push the right button next time. The next idea is this idea of aligning the enterprise. Uh, people have to be able to see that vision. They have to understand that vision. They have to see where it is that you're trying to go. Uh, without clear alignment, it's hard to create in people this constancy of purpose, this drive that helps them do what it is that you want them to do. Uh, personal example, at the O.C. Tanner Company, before we started our focus on operational excellence 25 years ago or so, uh, we had the wrong type of culture. It was very bureaucratic, it was top-down, authoritarian, uh, actually dictatorial, I would say. And the people who came to work basically knew that they were just going to do what they were told to do. And the net effect was not great outcomes. Right? People didn't own the results. In fact, uh, it was kind of drilled into people that management owned the results. And that management would fix the problems. People don't fix problems. People just come and, and do what they're told. Uh, some of the, what are some of the problems with that kind of culture? There's no innovation. No innovation. Innovation is just is absolutely cut off, right? Uh, and the managers maybe try to innovate. But what happens when the manager innovates and gives something new to these workers? No buy-in. No buy-in, right? If there's even something slightly wrong with it, they just let it kind of spindle and then fail, right? No one jumps in to say, hey, if we just adjust like this, it'll work. Right, what else? What else is wrong with that? No loyalty. No loyalty. That's right. I'm, I'm exchangeable, right? I, I can just I can take my services over here because I'm not valued there. What else is wrong with it? I mean, those are two great answers. So I don't. There's no personal satisfaction. Ah, powerful. No personal satisfaction, right? Where's the Where's the oomph that I get out of coming to work in the day? And that is what constancy of purpose provides for a person. Uh, the, the results that we were having at the time were really bad. Awful quality, awful delivery. Um, in fact, on quality, I will tell you that about every three months, we got a series of reports from the field. It was literally a sheet of papers about this thick, uh, line by line of all the quality issues that, that we were having in the last three months. It was that bad. And uh, people just kind of shrugged and, and went through it and did their jobs, right? Um, one of the ways that we focus on creating alignment, so I don't see OC Tanner, what we do is we, we sell appreciation products to companies, and we sell those systems and awards that help them appreciate people. And we had to help people understand that they weren't just creating an award, they were helping to be part of another recognition experience. Uh, 
right? And if they can understand that, that what I'm doing is something that has impact on people, we have to teach them that that, that award that you're making gives an opportunity for a company to do the right thing to an employee, for an employee to feel valued and honored. And by doing that, we create innovation, we create uh, engagement, and basically the company becomes a better place. We talk about impacting the world, the world becoming a better place because of the work you do here. Now that helps provide more of a reason to be engaged. And one of the highlights for me in terms of constancy of purpose was about three years ago, I was uh, standing behind a lady uh, who was, uh, who, she was finishing a watch. She was doing a watch for a 15 year uh, career achievement recipient. And I'm watching her work and she's, she's coming along. And when she's all done, I asked her, how are you doing today, Feli? And she said, I'm doing great. And I, I loved her energy. And I asked her, I said, well, why are you doing so great? And she said, because I just finished a 15 year award for, and she read me the name off the thing. And when he opens this up, it's going to make his day. Now, there is a woman who is aligned now, who has constancy of purpose. I don't have to worry if she's motivated to come to work. I don't have to worry about her doing high quality work, right? Because she's thinking about that end customer. Uh, I don't have to worry about whether she's going to be engaged with helping to improve processes, because she has a reason to do what she does every day. You kind of get the point that, that what we have to do is we have to figure out how to cascade whatever value it is that you're providing. We have to cascade that value down to the individual, which, which is more than mentioning it at once, right? It's more than bringing everyone together and having a meeting and saying, hey, this is what our value is, go get them, right? Well, what do you have to do more than that? What are some other thoughts? How do you cascade the, this, this purpose, this meaning? Yes, please, sir. So, um, one thing we've tried that has had some success now along this line is that initially we used to have on all of our staff meeting agendas, anybody who comes up with uh, innovative cost savings or efficiency will give you an incentive. Okay. No. No. So then, I wanted a war council. I saw that in a movie, so I wanted one. War council. War council. <laughs> okay. Assemble my war council. Right, right. So I bring this group together, and I tell them all the things that are bothering me. And then I say, take it back to your groups and bring, solve it. Yeah. Solve it. So instead of management solving all the problems, right. now these groups, there's two of them in our office, uh -huh. they're given the issue, and they're coming up with great ideas. So I kind of made it their, theirs. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so if you can help the people understand why we need to fix things, then put the problem in front of them. And that's really where we're going in this hour that we have here, is talking about getting people involved in these solutions. First thing you have to do is create that purpose and then cascade it down to your people. Thank you for, for that comment. So uh, what I want to show you is uh, kind of how that fits in terms of this triangle that Mark was talking about. Uh, he talked about creating value for the customer. I talked about this alignment by creating constancy of purpose. What we're not going to talk about is this section here on the principles of continuous improvement. And the reason why is because the most important part of this triangle is down here at the bottom. It's these cultural enablers. Uh, the two principles we're going to talk about is lead with humility and respect every individual. And the reason why this is so important is too many times when we receive some sort of change directive, the first thing we think is, I gotta come right here and start applying change principles. When in reality, what you gotta do first is create a vision of where to go, cascade it down, and then create the right culture that allows people, as indicated in this example, allows people to come up and drive towards these results. Are you with me? And so we're gonna spend some time today talking about why creating this culture, the way you interact with your people, the way you talk about your value, why it really matters, why it's the most, uh, the most crucial thing. Um, first of all, before we get into it, I'm gonna talk about respect every individual, and Mark's gonna talk about lead with humility. Before we do, I wanna share, oh, I did it again. I need a better process. Read this, read this to yourself if you
So I'm going to change the slide back just for a moment. You know, here in terms of results, certainly in the end, results are what we're craving, right? Results come out of what you're doing. I can tell you some of the results we've had at OC Tanner, for example. Our lead time used to be six weeks from the time we launched an order until it shipped. And now it's one hour. Went from six weeks to one hour. Um, our efficiency has quadrupled. Uh, quality, on-time delivery, all 99% plus. And all of that comes not from focusing here, hey, go out and give me those numbers. It comes from creating a long-term vision and creating this culture that allows people to drive those sort of results. Uh, for example, on the, on the efficiency gains, um, what we got to the point where we're actually creating efficiency gains faster than the business can grow. And so what we've done is we basically have stopped hiring. Uh, we're able to just let attrition kind of take its course over time. We have more people than we need right now. We have basically have those people focused on projects and improvements um, until people leave and then we can restaff teams and so forth. Um, we just finished our six month strategy deployment period. Every six months we set new goals and we go chase after them. Very ambitious goals like Chris was talking about in, in the session we were just in, crazy goals. Goals that when people say, you know, hey, we're going to get, we're going to get 20% gain in efficiency in the next six months. Does that sound crazy? A whole bunch of our teams did it. Uh, Thursday of this week, we had all the managers, facilitators come in and report all day long about their last six months, and I was astonished. Double-digit gains in efficiency and, and improvements in throughput time, uh, cutting across the organization. I think the smallest gain we had was a 5% gain in efficiency. If you think about that, that's in six months. That means in a year they have a 10% gain. That was the worst improvement uh, that we saw. And all of it comes from having people clearly see what you want and engaging them in achieving it. Um, so I can focus on, I can say to myself, I've got to increase the efficiency. I've got to improve the throughput time. I've got to improve the quality. But really, the only thing that I should be focusing on, I've got to create and manage this culture. Because if I don't do that, if I'm trying to do everything else, the culture ends up managing me. It just runs over the top. So um, I'm going to talk about respect every individual as foundational to driving improvements. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on why this idea of why, why would respecting every individual be foundational for driving improvement in an organization? Think respecting every individual is foundational for driving improvement in an organization. Because they will feel valued. And, and if someone feels valued, what does that do? Why does that help? Motivation. Motivation to work harder. Okay, good. Sir? Every person knows something you don't know. Yeah. Yeah, say more about that, Dennis. Oh. They're closer to it. Yeah. They live with it every day. Perfect. They know the cost of the benefits, they know how it feels. Right. And they can that in a way that you never could. Excellent. There's a line, I notice there's a line in the, uh, in the book under the uh, empowerment uh, or engage employees. It says, those involved directly in the work often have the greatest insights for how to make meaningful improvements. And that's what you're just saying, right, Dennis? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more when Mark gets into to lead with humility. Any other thoughts on, on why, we're going to go into this a little bit deeper, but before we do, any other thoughts on why respect every individual is foundational for driving improvement? Okay, now let me ask you this question. Other than the fact that it can get you better results, as we've just been talking about, is there is there any other basic foundational reason why we should respect every individual? Yes, ma'am. Well, they're creating a culture, like you're saying, or create culture that this is okay to disrespect this person, and other people will also. Yeah, no doubt about it. You'll create a chain reaction. It is definitely infectious. Disrespect is very infectious. Yes, sir. Can't overlook anybody. Everyone has their own purpose that matters. Do you have thoughts on that? Yes, ma'am. I think um, I think it's important to 
important to look at that and ask them to morale and even what people perceive from other agencies or other companies looking from the outside in. If they know that people are respected, yeah. then they know what to fix to work. Yeah, that's very important. Very important. Yes, ma'am. The right thing to do. <laughs> Just because it's the right thing to do. Say more about that. Why is it the right thing to do? It's how we all want to be treated. It's how it's how it, if we're like back to the life elevated. Yeah. You want to make things better. It's yeah. the right thing to do. It's just the core. Very good. What we should do. I'm gonna I'm gonna speak in just a second about being the right thing to do. There's one more hand back here. Well, I don't know exactly what if this is what you're after, but respecting everybody creates unity. Yeah. Unity creates uh, purpose. And purpose creates direction. No, that's 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 fantastic. Well said. That's exactly what I'm after. Yeah, in fact, I'm after. But everything you said sounded great to me. Foundationally, the other reason why we want to have, why we need to respect every individual, aside from all the impact, the good things that will come out of it, is because everyone has intrinsic value and unlimited potential. Because because we believe that everyone has intrinsic value and unlimited potential. We respect everyone. Does that make sense to you? We respect everyone because of that. If, if you go out and respect people because you think it will build morale, that's not gonna that's not gonna be effective. If you go out and respect everybody because you want them to think you trust them, that's not gonna be effective. But if you go out and respect everybody because you really believe that everyone has intrinsic value and unlimited potential, and you like that and you want to build on that, you want to help everyone get the most out of them, that is where you accomplish them. See, this isn't a gimmick, right? This is a foundational belief in human nature. You with me? It's a, it's a, it's a way of saying it. Yeah, I was going to say, just as, a, as a, a comment, when we talk about respect to every individual, it's not limited to people in the organization as well. I mean, it's the, it's the people you serve, it's your suppliers or people that interact with your organization. Um, the respect for all of them. I mean, you see a lot of companies that set up uh, supply relationships where they, they try to beat up their suppliers and it's not a win-win situation. Or I remember Chrysler in the 1970s, they had a terrible time. They were making products that really weren't that great. Um, they had a, the reason was basically they had a poisonous culture there. They internally had a name for their customers. At that time, most of the people buying Chrysler products were older people who remembered the good old days of Chrysler. And they, they had an acronym for them. They were called PODs. That was the name that they called internally. They referred to customers as PODs, which stood for poor, old, dumb, SHITs. So that's what they called their customers. And that kind of a culture will poison every decision you make, every interaction you have throughout. So you have to think every every individual, even the environment. We talk about it, you know, how you treat the environment, the community, et cetera. Well said, well said. So coming back to this previous idea here, uh, I would suggest that, that for me, uh, with my people, the most important use of my time is making sure that people feel respected, making sure that people have what they need. And some of the ideas I want to just talk, touch on briefly here in terms of showing ways that we, that we respect people is if you if you respect the individual, then you will do things that support them. Right? You'll invest in everyone's development and encourage them to realize their potential. Uh, this is this is more powerful than you may realize. By spending time with the people, you'll find that they become stronger and more able to make the improvements that you crave as an organization. Uh, at OCT, just one example of investing in everyone's development. Uh, we started about 15 years ago a one-on-one -on -one coaching system where every month, every person meets with their direct reports in a, in a development session. So I have I have five people to report to me, two vice presidents, two directors, and my administrative assistant. Every every month, I meet with them and talk about how can we how can we help each other be better. And uh, we found that when we first started doing that, uh, we were only about three months into it. This was about 15 years ago, and one of my production managers made the comment. That, that all of the, the, the interactive, difficult uh, things that were going on in her team have slowly dwindled away. That she is actually spending less time solving the interactive team issues, the problems, that she was now spending doing the coaching. 
that she found by investing in the coaching that other problems took care of themselves. Um, you know, a lot of times we spend time just dealing with, the, with, with all this, this anger, frustration, and, and interpersonal difficulties, when really if we'd be proactive and talk to everyone one-on-one -on -one and develop them and coach them, they start to feel respected and the other issues start to go away. Okay. Uh, also, uh, we would provide recognition. We foster dignity, honor the contribution of every employee, and we create uh, a sense of community that ensures physical and emotionally safe workplace. Yes, sir. May I ask you a question? Please do. How am I in a position, especially in organizations organization government, where they're working process or contract action? I might be pledged for the two and four who's truly a leech. Um, yeah. Who is very litigious, who is playing with every institution. You know, the most powerful force that I have discovered is social force. And as teams work together and expect high levels of performance from each other, the one person who is a leech, the one person who is inappropriate, begins to become an outcast of sorts. Everyone else is engaged, trying to drive things, and all of a sudden this person doesn't fit in. If, in fact, you don't have a cohesive team, that leech is able to tear that team apart. They're able to attack different pieces of it. If people stop interacting in a healthy manner, people will slowly things degrade in the team. But as the team gets stronger, that person becomes insignificant. And I actually found that in some of those situations, those people finally opt out. They decide, I can't even, you know, I can't even fit in here anymore. I'm not part of this group. I don't like being with these people who are so engaged, so high energy, all trying to do things. It's not for me. Right? I'll, go, I'll go work in New York. <laughs> that, that's the first thing that comes to mind to me, is that is I think social, social pressure is the most powerful. It's more powerful than, than a manager or an executive trying to dictate something that happens. Teams create norms, teams create expectations, and they raise that up to where people have to respond to it. And I've actually noticed people who've been very difficult, who didn't want to be managed, but who do allow themselves to get pulled into a team culture and work more effectively. I've seen that a lot. All right. We are going to do an exercise in your groups again. This won't be nearly as long. It will only take about five minutes to have you talk with each other. But this is the question I want you to ask yourself. What behaviors are evident when a culture promotes respect every individual? If your culture promotes respect every individual, what behaviors would you expect to see every day? And similarly, if, if this is not what your culture promotes, uh, what would you expect to see if the opposite were true? What behaviors would you see if respect was the rule of the day? What behaviors would you see in your organization if it is not? Can you do that? Let's take five minutes and talk about that. In your same groups, if you don't mind. Yeah. I think they got some. I think that's a good one. I agree. I
Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Excellent. Now, what, what about the other side? A culture that doesn't have respect. Uh, maybe this is a down note to, to end on on this one, but uh, maybe I should have done it first. I'll do that next time. Next time. Okay. Good. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> what are some of the uh, What are some of the things you'd expect to see in a culture that does not believe in respect for people? Selfishness. Selfishness. It's a lot of sick leave. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Honey, it's better if you just stay home, right? Yes, ma'am. Not being dependable. Very good. Yes, sir. What's that? Constant grousing, backbiting, just all the negative gossip. Yes. Gossip. Uh -huh. Gossip, backbiting, grousing, lack of dependability. Can you see how that gets in a, in, a, in a downward spiral? I don't respect, so this happens, so what happens? Less respect, right? Well, that's, that sounds deadly, a death spiral. Mm -hmm. uh, Bart from DHRM made this comment. People verbally support, but then they don't really support. Anything. Right, right. I'm, I'm right here with you. No, I'm not. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I think it's just the, the inability to allow people to Right, right. It's kind of like lobsters trying to crawl out of the pot. No, you don't. Okay, right. Good. Yes, ma'am. We kind of called it a mad bad sack. Okay. Okay. Not only affects your system and everyone around you, but also makes it really horrible for you to control. Yeah. Yeah. What a miserable way to work, right? Now, and you may, yes, sir. I was just going to say, and I also think it has to go back to the question why. The real why is what we can do. And that's why we respect each other. And if you don't respect someone, then maybe you create that feeling of you don't exist. If they don't exist, then they're very minimal. If they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're just fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm done. Yes, I'm not done. Please. I was just going to say that it fosters an environment of distrust yes. to the point where it's a dog eat dog world, and I don't care about what you're doing, I'm going to worry about me because I don't trust you, and I don't trust them upstairs, and I don't trust them downstairs. So I'm going to worry about me, and I become siloed within my uh, program and in my job. Extremely well said. I hope you see that without that respect, it all falls apart in here. You're trying to you're trying to create this value. Let's go, guys. Let's go, and nothing is happening. It doesn't matter which tools you apply. It doesn't matter which principles of potential group you focus on. If you haven't got that respect, nobody follows. Nothing happens. And uh, when you as you go back and try to focus on this idea. You may say to yourself, yeah, but this team or these people over here, there's nothing worth respecting in them. Come back to this thought right here. Yes, there is. Because they're a person. They deserve respect. You begin to respect, and then we start that cycle going up instead of spiraling down. Okay. So we're not just talking about this kind of warm, touchy-feely, organizational behavior kind of stuff. These are things that are crucial to success for an organization. So what you need to do is you think about this, you know, we talk about support or recognition or community, whatever. If you think to yourself, well, if I respect every individual, then I'm going to have, this is how you can talk about your organization, we're going to have to have a way in which to um, have people give their ideas, value their inputs and their suggestions for improvement. Well, then if I do that, then I have to have a system around that suggestions or idea management or whatever, you know, engaging them. So you, in other words, you, your logic and process takes you from this all the way down into the details to say then, let's look at what systems we need. Now you may have some legacy systems and say, oh, I don't really know. Does that legacy system, does it support this? Is it necessary? We may want to just throw it out. Maybe it needs to be redone. But but eventually you'll get to some hard actionable items to make improvements. But it, as, as Gary had pointed out, when you do it with uh, when you do it with this sense of uh, focus on alignment, here we go. <laughs> The sense of alignment, then you uh, you know that you're going to be uh, doing the things that are going to make the long-term sustainable improvements. Let's see. 
What are you doing, Mark? Well, <laughs> I hate to say it, but I'm not, uh, I'm a Mac guy. <laughs> so, it's been a while since I've had to look at a Windows device. And whenever I do, it just gives me nightmares from past uh, experiences. So I'm always happy to have made that jump a number of years ago. All right. But I hope you'll see, though, that these things aren't just vague, ambiguous, you know, feel-good kind of things. And this, this seems to have, have, there we go, it's starting to wake up. All right. Uh, but they're real concrete things. You need to get to a point where you're not just saying, oh, okay, let's all have respect. You know, we'll just have a big group hug and then we'll go back to beating each other up. You know, you really need to say, well, if it's true, that principle's true, then what does it mean to the systems, the way we interact, and how we do things, and, and what we measure? So I want to talk about the final principle as we close out, which is linked with humility. Um, I think that if we were to take a poll in organizations, especially places like military or corrections or whatever, and say, okay, leaders leading with humility, is that necessary? Well, <laughs> it's, it's, this is an interesting principle, leading with humility. We want to talk about this because it's absolutely critical to an organization's success. Now, you'll find a lot of organizations where the leader is not humble. Now, they can be successful for a period of time, or they can be marginally successful for a long time. But to be truly successful in terms of the organization reaching its full potential, there needs to be humility in, in leadership. And I'm, uh, I think mean, this is slowly starting to run out of, uh, of energy, perhaps. It's slow moving around this video. Yeah, it could be. So we're gonna watch a quick, uh, a quick video here. Aerospace up in Ogden. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Barnes Aerospace. They do a lot of aircraft parts for a lot of the military, the, the Air Force, including uh, the stealth bombers and other things. It's a great organization. And uh, this past May, they won the Shingo Prize, which is a, a really a nice honor uh, for that uh, for that organization. And uh, this is thank you. So what we're going to have to do is uh, I'm going to bypass. The, uh, the short video, unfortunately, and, um, and we're just going to jump to the next, uh, <coughs> all right, but uh, if we talk about vulnerability and we talk about, sorry, humility, one of the things that we look at, uh, humility is actually, uh, although it's perceived by many as a weakness, Humility is actually a great strength. If you're very comfortable with who you are and you're very willing to be open to other people making comments, suggestions, giving feedback in order for you to grow, um, then you're able to learn. You'll, you'll learn so much from other people as they come and say, you know, I noticed that you did this or I noticed that you managed this way or whatever it happens to be. But if you're, if you're vulnerable, if you're open, and allow yourself to be exposed and receptive to those kinds of things, you can grow. And growth is a necessary part of, of becoming a better leader if you grow. And your, your organizations as well, that when you allow the, the, the group to, uh, to function in that kind of humble leadership uh, approach, then the group is able to grow. Because if you're, if you're a humble leader, that means that you're willing to have some vulnerability to allow decision making to be done, you know, in the, by someone else. You know, if you have that kind of command and control, I make all the decisions because I know best, your organization's not going to grow very well. But we see that in some organizations where they have that, that mentality, that approach, that uh, there might be a problem on a, at the ground level, wherever that is in the organization, they say, well, I have to talk to somebody, and then they have to talk to somebody else, and 
then they have to you know go to another person and eventually that decision is made and then it gets kind of uh, channeled down into the organization that's never going to be an efficient way to work people aren't feeling engaged or empowered and all that kind of thing so this is why we make a statement of why why lead with humility because all growth requires vulnerability that vulnerability is a powerful thing that if you turn that on, if you're willing to let other people make decisions because you trust them, if you're willing to, to receive feedback from people and allow others to you know help others to receive feedback as well, it can be a great thing. These are the three key things we look at in Lead with Humility. Servant leadership. Um, and you know, we get, and hopefully most people, get deep satisfaction in seeing other people grow and seeing other people succeed. That's where the real leadership is. It's in other people succeeding and growing. Encourage. We recognize our own strengths and weaknesses and acknowledge our mistakes and are constantly seeking to learn from others. And empowerment. We delegate decision making where appropriate and we trust each other. Now this is something It's difficult to go from a, a, a culture where there is no humility and there is no respect to just suddenly saying, okay, let's turn it on but it's something that's absolutely critical if you're going to achieve the full potential of your uh, of your organization. So let's see if this works. Okay, good. So we're, uh, we're right at the end of our time limit, but this is the final thing for you to think about. Just do this at home we go. Ask yourself the question, in looking at your organization and looking at your own style of, of leading, and say, what kind of behaviors would I expect to see if the organization in which I work is has an organization with a culture of leading with humility. What would that look like? People would be willing to share information, people would be willing to receive feedback, other people would be trusted to make wise decisions, um, etc. And then what would you expect to see if that were not the case? So of the things that we've covered today, we've covered the role of culture and the need to manage it. We've talked about the shingle model and we've covered four of the key principles. The principle of create value for the customer. This was the light elevated. The principle of constancy of purpose of getting everybody in alignment with that. And then we've talked about respect and humility. Now what? In your organizations, how can the, this understanding of these four things um, really if you reflect upon them and look at your organization in a careful way, how can they help you to be better? How can they help you to really create that quality of life, that life elevated for the people you serve, the people in your organization as well? And, and then make a plan. Work with your group, with the people in your organization to, uh, to discuss it and come up with, uh, with an action plan to help make the improvements. But, we thank you all for your time. It's been a delight to be with you this morning and hope you'll have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much.